Our first stop, Carla Hall's Washington, D.C. home, where her treasures include prized family heirlooms. My name is Carla Hall, and I'm a chef, TV host, and cookbook author. Carla has brought her energy and good taste to a number of shows, including The Chew and Worst Cooks in America. We're going to cut our mushrooms, cutting them evenly so they cook evenly. And a lot of people know me from Top Chef. Hootie hoo! <laughs> you know, I've been watching this show for so long. So from the Roadshow experts, I'm, I want to know a little more history about the things that we have. I want to know if there's a story before the story that I have. I know that a lot of our items have um, personal value, but I never think about monetary value. That would be actually kind of fun to find that out. Carla and her mom, Audrey, share some family memories of what got passed down through the generations. My father was a collector, I would say. He was one that was a saver, you know. I'm a saver. And, and it's a good thing. <laughs> Save your money and uh, that kind of go OK, into. maybe I'm not that kind of a saver. <laughs> <laughs> I picked up the stuff saving, maybe not the money saving. But, you know, I got half of it. Roadshow expert Reed Donovan drops by Carla's home to check out some family furniture that's been used by three generations. This table was in my grandmother's house for as long as we can remember. And I just remember this table having little trinkets and a nightlight. And then when she passed away, my sister got it. What about the high chair? The high chair usually sat in the den. When was your mama born? 1908. 1908, OK. <laughs> mm -hmm. You think that might have been her chair? That's a possibility. Yeah. What you've got is two examples of late 19th, early 20th century manufactured furniture. They both date from a similar time period, from the 1880s up until about the 1920s. Each of them is about that, but could fall into that category. Oh, yeah. There's a label inside the table drawer. Oh, it it says Wolverine Manufacturing Company, at Detroit, Michigan. Look at us. Oh, Look at you. Not. And your table has a leg on it, which we called the barley twist leg. There was a type of candy in the 19th century called barley sugar. This twisted piece of candy resembles the leg. And so that's where the barley twist okay. name comes from. Look at that. Oh my God, that's exactly why we kept this table. <laughs> because it's food related. Because it's food related. <laughs> your chair has a pressed back. Mm -hmm. And by a pressed back, you might look at that and think that that's all hand carved, but it's not. Wow. It's actually uh, a, t a template is made on a roller die, which is with great pressure rolled onto the piece of wood to impress it with that decoration oh. to make it look like it's carved by hand, but it's right. actually not. Looking at it, it looks like yours is a convertible high chair. Have you ever tried to play around with it to see if it no. does anything else? Uh-uh. If you were to see either one of these come up for auction, I think you could see either piece bring perhaps as little as $100, but they could bring upwards of $300, maybe even $400 wow. a piece, depending on who yeah. the, is the makeup in the audience uh -huh. that day. I can't wait to see what this does. I think that's the, that's oh, yeah. the biggest right. question mark. Like, how many things, this is like a transformer. It's what does it transform like yeah. into? It has wheels on it, so it must do something else. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! I see! I can't believe y'all didn't know that. I taught you something today. Oh, you yeah. taught Oh my well, that, You know, that makes sense. The surprises don't end there for Carla. Coming up, Reed dishes on her kitchen-related objects, and vintage clothing expert Katie Kane serves up some fun facts about Carla's more stylish pieces. My dream find at an auction would be some kind of old bowl or rolling pin. I love rolling pins, by the way. I love rolling pins. If anybody wants to give me a rolling pin, okay. So <laughs> I just love rolling pins. I think my dream find probably would, would be something that I can use in the kitchen. It's no surprise that this chef's dream find would be related to food. Reed Donovan stuck around to see what culinary collectibles Carla has already scooped up. So these seltzer bottles were bought at a flea market. They were $5 each, you know, nothing precious. Just, oh, hey, I love the color. And this ice cream scoop 
was my grandmother's. When I looked at it, I was thinking, oh my gosh, look at the hardware on this thing. It's nothing like the ice cream scoops that I have today that are just so flimsy. Plus, I was a scooper at an ice cream store back when I was a teenager. I have the scoop for you. Oh, you have the scoop I have for the me? Scoop for okay, you. On, both of the, on, on both of these things. Okay. Well, for me, it's like the old soda fountain. It's exactly what I thought of yeah. when I saw these things. The soda fountain was a place off in a counter inside of another store that you would go to get a fresh uh, fizzy drink. And the soda fountain craze first came about in the 1850s or so, and then it continued for over 100 years through the 1950s. There has been a resurgence in popularity with this kind of thing as a collectible. We're seeing a revival in classic cocktails again. The bottle in the middle is rather interesting in that its label actually has a Star of David on it. A lot of the deliverers of seltzer bottles and the people who own the refilling stations for seltzer bottles in the early 20th century had Jewish backgrounds and they deliberately put the Star of David to show how proud they were of their Jewish heritage. Wow, that, interesting? that is so interesting. So let's talk about the ice cream scoop. The ice cream scoop was invented in 1897 in Pittsburgh by a man named Alfred Kroll. And Alfred actually was working in a hotel and a restaurant where he noticed behind the soda fountain that the soda jerks were having a lot of trouble separating the ice cream from the spoons they were using. So Alfred came up with the ingenious idea of putting a mechanism inside of the bowl to eject the ice cream. Brilliant. He was, interestingly enough, the first African-American man in Pittsburgh to patent anything and hold a patent. Sadly, though, he never became famous for it and he didn't get rich because it was such a simple, easy, brilliant idea that everybody did knockoffs. Mm -hmm. And soon enough, you, everyone had forgotten who had come up of with course. this genius idea. Mm -hmm. Now, your ice cream scoop was manufactured by the Benedict Manufacturing Company located in Syracuse, New York and they were in business from 1894 until 1953. So it was definitely made before 1953. Uh, the brand is called Indestructo. The ice cream scoop, I see those available online regularly, vintage ones, anywhere from 15 to 25 or $30. Mm -hmm. They don't bring a lot of money, but they sell. People really, and people prefer the old ones to the new ones. Because they're good. And they don't break. <laughs> <laughs> and they're indestructible. <laughs> now the seltzer bottles, there are a lot of people that collect them. People like the blue bottles better. And they tend to bring on a retail level anywhere from $40 up to 120 or so per what? bottle. I love these things. I still love the blue just as much as I did 20 years ago when I bought them. And I will definitely continue to use my granny's ice cream scoop. Yeah. Yep, yep, the three quarters. My sister and I, Kim and I used to play this game called Deary. And we would get dressed up in my grandmother's fur coats and we would put on her hats and her jewelry and we would be like, hey Deary, how are you Deary? <laughs> but it was all about my grandmother's fashion and I think that passed down just in my modeling days without really thinking about that connection of modeling and really enjoying fashion and mixed prints. I probably get that from my grandmother. Vintage clothing and couture specialist Katie Kane assesses the personal artifacts Carla Hall inherited from her fashionable grandmother. So these were my grandmother's bags. Mm -hmm. We called her Granny, and she had such a flair. I remember her carrying this one. And the other two, I just remember getting them, going through her things mm -hmm. when she passed away. I don't remember her carrying this one. I would have been afraid to see that one as a kid. I was like, ah! <laughs> that would have been a little, a little too much That for is me. a reaction a lot of people have to that yeah. type of bag. Right? So her name was Freddie Mae Glover. Okay. And so hence the F on mm -hmm. this bag. Or for fashionista. Yes. <laughs> yes. With the pearl F on the center. These are all hand stitched. Wow. And then it's hand outlined in gold bugle beads. And then you have the gold bugle bead leaves and flowers to make the F look like part of a bouquet. And this lovely scroll work of pearls that goes all the way around, stitched on the satin. Uh, I've never seen a bag like this with the monogram or with this plastic covering. But it's made by a company called Patricia of Miami. Uh -huh. And they were well known for their plastic and lucite bags, which would have been a little earlier than this. I've never seen one quite like that. This one is the newest of the group. 
Okay. Okay, this okay. one is probably from the very late 50s or early 1960s, somewhere in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And this one is lizard, and then it has a centerpiece of black suede. It's an unusual bag in that it is this coloration, sort of the cream and the gray, almost black lizard skin. Most of the ones that you run across are either black or brown. Mm -hmm. So this is a more special bag. And this one was made by Sydney of California. So we've got Miami, we've got California, <laughs> and now we're going to Havana. Oh my gosh! <laughs> this one is the oldest of the group. Uh huh. This is from 1940, and wow. it's an 1940s, I should say. Okay. Uh, we can't date it exactly. These were very, very popular. A lot of American tourists would go to Cuba for vacation, and they would very often bring these bags home as souvenirs. People either really, really love them uh -huh. or don't care for them at all. There doesn't seem to be any middle ground right. on the alligator bag with the head right. and the feet. And then on the back, you know, it's the full alligator body. You've got his back legs there, too. It's the full skin. And then this one, we also know belonged to your grandmother, Freddie, because it's got her three initials yes, in the center. Yes, Freddie Mae Glover. Yes. This one is always a conversation piece. A value on this one in this condition would probably be about $150, mm -hmm. maybe $200. This one is in about the same range. This is a little bit harder for a a retail sale in that you have to find another person who's got an F initial. Oh. And then this one is in the $300 to $350 what? range. Yeah, so this oh is... Oh my gosh! Well, this one is in the best condition. It would look the most stylish and sort of fit in with mm -hmm. contemporary clothing. Who knew? Because <laughs> honestly, they've been living in my closet. Okay. So mm -hmm. let's get them out. I'm going to have my little purse on. Mm -hmm. They're like, Carla, where are you going? to get the mail. <laughs> I had no idea how uh, well made that table was. I could dance on that table. Oh my gosh, but the moment, I, the high chair. chair. I had. What? <laughs> I don't know who sat in that high chair. Or who I rolled mean, in it. I right. mean, it went choo -choo, choo -choo. <laughs> I love it even more now. It's so, I think every day I'm going to be like, chuk, 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 chuk. that was freaking awesome.